Okay, um, so welcome back everybody. We will be talking now about a couple more, a little bit more advanced, a little bit more kind of um, uh, complex topics, um, which are performance and security. Uh, we'll start with performance and we'll move on to security. And I'm just gonna go through a set of um, some simple things that everyone should think about when they're building applications, particularly DHS2 applications, but applications in general, when it comes to performance uh, and security and how to use some of the tools that are available, such as the, the app platform and the um, uh, data engine to improve and, and the REST API for DHS2 to improve performance with, without a lot of effort um, and what to, what to think about when you're looking at an application to figure out what, what could be improved or what needs to be improved. So I'm gonna share that screen now. And let's go back to the top here. Okay, so we're going to talk about performance. There are three um, topics within this that I'll cover. Um, the main two, I'll, I'll actually mostly just be talking about network bandwidth and bundle size, and then I'll describe a little bit what will be coming in the future um, about uh, with progressive web apps and what that means for performance. So right off the bat, network bandwidth is important. That's the, the first thing to, to keep in mind and to know. Um, and that's because uh, your application and DHS2 in general might be used in poor network con conditions. This is actually quite common with users of DHS2 across the world because in a lot of cases, a health facility, for example, might not have uh, a fiber optic connection to the internet. Um, it might have a, uh, a slow DSL connection or it might more likely have a uh, mobile network connection, either 3G or maybe 4G, um, some cases even 2G, but that's uh, uh, even, even more difficult to use DHS2. But if you have a 3G wire, wireless uh, mobile connection uh, and you're trying to use a DHS2 application, it becomes very important to, uh, for, the, for us as application developers to think about how many bytes we're actually sending across the network so that it won't take seconds or minutes for an application to load or for things to happen in your application when uh, someone is on a low bandwidth connection. Um, it can also be important to minimize the number of requests to improve performance. Um, that's less, less critical than the byte size, the size of the actual payload in most cases. Um, but if you end up with thousands of requests, um, that could be problematic because there is a high latency between when you start a request and when it actually finishes or comes back from the server. Um, even if the, um, the, uh, the network is uh, fast, if it has high latency, uh, even if it's a very small request, it could take a, um, a long time to go to the server and come back to the user. And if you then have thousands of requests that need to do that, it could make your application feel very slow. Um, this becomes particularly important when you have what's called a waterfall of requests, which means that you send a request, you wait for that request to finish and come back to the client. And then after you re receive the response, you have to send another one. So in situations where there's high latency in the network, uh, that can take a very long time or make your application very, very slow because you need to send, maybe it takes two seconds to send the request, two seconds for the request to come back, a response to come back, and then you send the second request, which takes another two seconds, another two seconds to come back. That's at least eight seconds of just two requests going across the network. So trying to avoid um, waterfalls where you have, especially when it's more than just two levels deep. So if you have uh, a request that needs to wait for a response and then another request, another request, another request, and 10 requests down the line, 10 times four is 40 seconds that you're waiting for those requests to finish. Um, and you have to, at a minimum, give the user a good um, understanding of what's happening during that time. Uh, and if not, uh, if you, that, that's if you can't reduce the number of requests or the, or the size of the waterfall. Um, 
Another consideration when talking about network bandwidth is caching. So in a lot of cases, the DHS2 API will do intelligent network caching for you. So the browser will actually have some cache headers on certain requests and it won't request that data again. Um, but that's not always true. And you want to kind of make sure that you're doing a trade-off where um, you're not showing the user stale information because it's in the cache you wanna make sure that it's always as, as up-to-date as possible. So to address that, right now, there are some ways to do it in applications uh, as, they, as they exist today. Mostly that's around using a Redux store or uh, a, a service worker in your application. But in the future, in the near future, uh, App Runtime will do automatically do client-side caching. There's actually some pull requests open on App Runtime right now uh, to explore different ways to do this. Um, we need to do it in a conscientious way to make sure that the uh, that we're not um, showing the user stale data and that the application can still request up-to-date information when it's needed. Um, but in a lot of cases, you make the same request or similar request from different places in the same application. We should be able to utilize client-side caching so that we don't send a request across the network every time. Um, for uh, static resources, which are like JavaScript and CSS and HTML as well, you don't have to worry about the index.html, um, you want to make sure that files have a unique hash in their name. What this means is that if the file is has a, actually a hash of that file, um, then no other file with the same name will ever exist because it uh, if it does, then it will be an identical file, and then it doesn't need to be requested across the network. This allows us to do very long-term um, caching of those static assets, things like C JavaScript files, um, on the browser, because we know that the, the version on the server, server will never be the, uh, the same, uh, it will never be different than what we have on the browser if the hash is available. Um, the this does happen automatically for generated files when you're using the platform um, it uses uh, webpack to do this um, and it it also happens automatically if you're using something like create react app and a lot of modern tooling um, but if you're using files or putting files in the public folder of your application um, and you're not adding hashes manually then you might run into issues with caching um, the, uh, yeah, so you would, you would want to add a hash to the static files that are stored, stored in the public folder. Okay. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about caching. There's a lot more that could be said about caching and how to improve it in your, um, uh, in your application, um, but generally we're going to work on improving the way that caching is done in the runtime. Um, so soon that shouldn't be an issue to, to think about too much um, for data. And then for static resources, so long as you use the default um, uh, ability to have a hash in the name of the files and you uh, add a hash to file names in the public folder. You can also, it doesn't have to be a hash necessarily, but if it's a specific enough name, um, like you have the full version number of your jQuery fi um, JavaScript file, for instance, in the public folder, then that is a good kind of first step for um, setting up, um, uh, yeah, for, for avoiding um, cache misses in, the, uh, in your application. Another important thing, and this is actually um, has come up a number of times recently in some core DHS2 applications as well, uh, is that DHS2, the DHS2 API has the ability to specify pagination. So you can say, I want 50, uh, I want the first 50 indicators or the first 50 uh, org units or the first 10 uh, TEIs from a specific request or something like that. Um, and there's a, there is also an option in that REST API to turn off pagination. So you can say paging equals false in some API requests. 
but don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, it's, it's tempting because then you don't have to deal with the case where there's more than 50 indicators and you need to add pagination controls on your, in your application. But what happens when all of a sudden there are 50,000 org units or 100,000 users or 10,000 indicators or dashboards that they, those users have created? Uh, then all of a sudden you're downloading 10,000 or more um, objects across the network which can be very, very expensive. Um, so you can't assume in almost any case that it's possible to request all of any collection across the network. Um, and for that reason, it's highly discouraged to use paging equals false. Um, we've been bitten by this in, in the core team as well in a number of cases where with the rollout of COVID vaccination campaigns that are using uh, DHS2 for, for um, implementations that are covering an entire country with 15 million TEIs that have tens or hundreds of thousands of users. Um, they're running into issues using the user's application because it assumed that there would never be 100,000 users. Um, and so it's something that needs to be taken into account. Um, there is a warning that's shown in the console when in, de de uh, in development mode, uh, if you're using the app runtime, uh, a, a modern recent version of the app runtime, that will tell you when you're using paging false, um, as well as if you're not spec specifying fields correctly, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, don't ignore that warning, um, if at all possible. So try to uh, look at those, uh, take a critical look at those um, requests that are being made by the app runtime or those queries that you're using in order to um, uh, yeah, reduce or make sure that you're using pagination and specifying fields explicitly. Um, there are a number of challenges that happen or, or uh, symptoms of not using paging in a DHS2 instance that has a lot of objects or a very big database. Um, sometimes the browser will freeze. Um, in most cases, it will freeze. And that's because if you're not doing this in a service worker, which most uh, applications are not today, um, you are actually need to stop the browser from doing anything while that request is sending. And if you have 100,000 users that you're requesting across the network, it might be tens or even 100 megabytes of data, um, which is takes a very long time, even on a very fast connection. Um, it can also uh, be unreasonable to um, and completely useless on mobile, because if you have a one gigabyte per month uh, data plan or something, 100 megabytes is uh, for for a single request on a single web page is not something that you want to be happening. Um, the browser might even crash if it takes too long because it might run out of memory depending on the, the, the browser or the, the um, system that the user is using. Um, and what could be even worse is because it's requesting all of this information um, from the server, it's quite expensive and heavy for the server to do as well, uh, and the entire server might crash. Um, so the moral of the story is if you don't use paging, everyone will be sad, uh, and you don't want everyone to be sad. So please use paging. Here's how to use page pagination in a query as well as directly through the REST API. The example on the right with the red border here is what you should not do. You can do this, but uh, do not do it, please. Everyone will be sad. And that's because uh, we're setting paging as false with the user's resource. This can be quite problematic because there might be 100,000 users and we don't wanna request 100,000 users across the network. Um, in most cases, if you're requesting a, a large set of users um, for a search or something like that, you want to show maybe the first 10 results only. Um, so just set the page size to 10, uh, and then you can actually add pagination or continuous scrolling and those types of things as well. So the, the example on the left here is what you should be doing. Um, you can set the page size to anything you want, whatever makes sense for your application. The default is usually 50 for most resources. Um, but you can set it to 10, 
you can set it to two, you can set it to a hundred. Um, just make sure that there is some limit and you know how many users will be returned from this uh, result. So there's an upper bound on the size of, of that request. Uh, and if you're doing uh, this in uh, outside of the app, app runtime, um, this is what it would look like in uh, on the bottom here. That's what it would look like as a, a an API request across the network um, as a, a yeah as just a, a regular REST API request. Um, so you'll see you have the page size equals fifty and page equals one. Um, don't set paging equals false in that um, URL. Another thing that's kind of related to pagination, but uh, slightly different and maybe a little bit more subtle is the concept of fields. So most of the metadata resources in DHIS2 include the option to specify which fields you want in the response. Um, if you don't specify any fields in your request, by default, many fields are returned by the API. So there's basically a, a default set that might be quite verbose, um, and you don't usually need all of those. Um, when this, this gets even worse when you're requesting um, resources from a collection endpoint, because you might request, even if you're paginating to 100, if you have 10 times as much data per object um, than, as what you need, then <clears throat> it can take, uh, it can be quite, it will be 10 times as, as big. And with 100 objects times 10 times, it's quite large. Um, uh, payload that will be going across the network. In particular, you need to pay attention to fields which result in embedded resources, um, and specifically for embedded collections. What this means is if you're looking at the user group endpoint, for, in, for, for example, uh, a single user group might have 10,000 users assigned to it, which means that if you request the user group endpoint or the user group resource, um, and say a page size of one, you still might end up downloading 10,000 users if you include the users field in that response. Um, to demonstrate this, I'm going to quickly go through uh, an ex uh, a quick example. Um, so let's go ahead and do this in the, um, in the data query playground. So I can do this quick example. So this is not a huge database. It's a fairly small one. I'm gonna go ahead and close these because I don't need these. Oops. Um, but here we're going to request user groups. So again, this is not a large um, uh, large database. So it's not written, it shouldn't be a huge problem to, to um, it, we won't see a problem in the, in the browser here or in the server because this isn't talking to a large database. But if it were a large database, it could be quite problematic. And even on this database itself, um, which isn't that large, we can still see significant performance improvement by um, applying some of the things we just learned about. So I'm gonna start by just getting rid of this field. So we're, we're just gonna get the users groups endpoint um, without passing any, um, any parameters. So we do that, we'll see that it is paginated by default. So we have a page size of 50. Um, there are a total of 31 here. They all fit on this first page. Um, but if there were 10,000, we would still only get 50 in this response, which is good. Um, in this case, the user group's default um, fields is quite, uh, quite sparse. So we only get the ID and the display name of the user group when we request it. Um, for some other resources, let's say for instance, visualizations, this might be much more, uh, let's see if there's, if there's another one. Actually, I think this has been fixed in 236. So this might actually be, uh, the default is not as verbose as you'd want. But let's say that you want uh, a different field here. And so you say fields, Let's say fields is going to be star, which is quite common when you're debugging things to use field star. And now we end up with a whole ton of fields in this um, response. So for all of these indicators, there are 50 indicators on this page. Um, we have a large number of fields um, that, were, that are being returned. 
Um, there's information about some embedded objects like a user. There's some other information about um, sharing, things like this, that probably in most cases we don't want. Um, so in, for, for indicators, this could be, um, could be problematic just in terms of the number of fields that we're returning here. But if we go back to our user groups, user groups endpoint and, and execute this, we're, we're now getting a large number of um, fields back and we're using the star, um, the star fields, which we should, should never do if, if we have any option not to. Um, but you'll see that this actually includes the ID of every single user that is in this group. Um, so that's, that's quite large. And maybe if we're not listing the users in this group, that's useless to us and it's just wasted bandwidth. Let's go ahead and um, clear this log here and execute this again. Let's see how big this request is. So this is a five kilobyte request across the network. It's not huge, but it doesn't need to be. So if we only want the ID display name, and let's say, um, To something else that we want from this. Let's say um, let's just say href. Um, there's some other ones here. Let's say last update. See, those are the only data. That's the only data that we actually want from this. So when I make this request again, uh, we just had a, an 80% re reduction in the size of this network request um, because it went from five kilobytes to four or to one. Um, so this can be quite, quite useful. Um, there's also the uh, concept of embedding resources. So we have this, if we have this star, we get the, the ID of, uh, we get the ID of each user that's associated with this. But if we actually did this, uh, again, something I would not recommend, this will give us all of this, all of the fields of each of the users that are associated with this, um, uh, with this uh, user group. So this uh, becomes quite a bit more. And actually, users is a is a fairly sparse um, class, at least in two thirty six. In two thirty four, it's quite a bit bigger. Um, so this actually has now gone up to fourteen or fifteen kilobytes. Um, even though we're probably not using all of this, and if there were ten thousand users instead of uh, ten assigned to this user group we would get uh, potentially in the megabytes of um, information going across the network for no, for no good reason. Um, if I switch to the, um, if I switch here to a different server, let's say one that is on 235, uh, let's say 234. I need to add this to the one moment. Need to add this to the cores list for this this group, I believe. Da, 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 da. So let's go ahead and remove this, or add this to the course list and make it all not recommended to do this in production environments, but for testing, it's okay. All HTTPS requests should be fine. Let's go ahead and log in. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and try this um, user groups um, endpoint here um, with a star and users star result. Uh, let's see what we get here. So here we end up, remember before we had 15 kilobytes, now we're at 22 um, because we're getting a lot more information about these users. Um, this was reduced in for, for security reasons in 236 um, because the, most of this information about this user shouldn't be exposed to other users. Um, so that is fixed in 235, I think, actually. Um, but uh, this also shows that uh, 
there can be quite a bit of information embedded in these objects. And let's see even, even further. So we have users, then we actually have user roles. Um, so if we go users star comma user roles star, we can really mess this up. <laughs> we can have some pretty big problems. Um, actually that didn't work exactly. Um, I think maybe user roles only has the ID in this in this object. But there can you can deeply nest some of the uh, information that you're requesting, maybe organization units. Okay, yeah, so that those ones only have objects of oh, organization units. Um, so we can't get too deep here, but we're still at 23 kilobytes instead of um, instead of 1.4, um, which we might get otherwise. Now let's also turn paging off. So if we say paging false and execute that, um, we're still about the same size because we have a, a limited number of user groups in this um, uh, in this with this endpoint, um, but we, you'll see that there's no paging now. So if there, there were only 31 user groups um, to begin with, so we had a paging, page size of 50, um, we were seeing all of those results, but now we have quite a, quite a few. Um, uh, we basically would, if there were 100 user groups, we would see 100 different um, uh, responses. If we do users, instead, there aren't that many users, but we're, we get a number, um, we get all of them at the same time. Let's say visualizations. And again, user star doesn't make sense in visualizations. Let's go ahead and do this. Here we go. That is how long it takes just to get the list of visualizations in a very small demo database with um, paging false and field star. And that is um, more than almost a, meg uh, almost a megabyte of, of raw data, 100 kilobytes across the network, um, quite problematic. So this is just some examples of both paging and fields and how you have to be very careful when you're doing it, even with default um, default pagination. So if we don't pass any fields, uh, but we say paging false. So with default fields, uh, actually in this case, it's pretty, pretty okay. Um, let's say dashboards. Okay, so we actually backported this, which is good. Um, so let's say fields star for dashboards. That's also, again, quite a big request. That was 12 kilobytes. Um, let's see if we get, uh, yeah, and that also returns all of the dashboard items. Um, this can be, can get quite expensive quite quickly. So again, just a demonstration of use, using you always use paging um, use the smallest paging that you can can get away with. So if I say page size two um, instead of page page size 50 default, then it will be very, very fast and very, very small network request. That is 577 bytes instead of 12 kilobytes. Okay. Um, let's see what the next one is. So this is just kind of expansion on exactly what I was saying before. Um, be careful with embedded resources, embedded collections. If you try to expand those fields, you can have problems. Um, avoid using star or all in fields uh, at, at all costs, if at all possible, because that can be uh, very problematic on large databases. And it makes caching more difficult because we don't have an explicit set of the fields that we want. So we can't do things like requesting only the field we don't already have available in, in the network or in the in the app runtime in the future. Um, this is another, yeah, just basically the same, same thing, um, talking about caching, talking about um, uh, what to do to test your um, performance of your applications. Um, the size of your JavaScript bundle will affect how performant your application is. Um, it can take quite a long time to load on 3G networks. So we were just doing this, this example with 
um, uh, let's say visualizations, paging false. We did this one, paging false and um, fields star. Um, if we open this up now and we, you'll see that I have the network tab of my Chrome Dev tools open, have disabled cache and I have no throttling. Um, this will show me how long it takes for this network to come, this, this request to come across the network. It's still fairly fast because I have a quite a fast network connection here, um, but it is almost hundred kilobytes and more than a second. If I then change to fast 3G, um, which is a more realistic um, representation of what a lot of DHS2 users will be using, it will take uh, a bit longer. Actually, that didn't take as long as I thought it was going to. Let's try slow 3G. So that can take quite a bit longer as well. Um, it's also important to note that for things like JavaScript, um, if we look at, uh, for instance, this here, um, uh, hopefully you can see this. Uh, this is an example of a DHS2 application in uh, JavaScript and what you can see in the network tab for this application and what you should look at. So this is using fast 3G. We've disabled cache. This is quite a large application. So it has more than a megabyte of um, resources, uh, 1.2 megabytes actually, um, which is quite a bit. Um, it probably could be slimmed down uh, a fair amount. Um, but there, uh, yeah, there, th these are the metrics that you want to look at. And we'll talk about how this is split up into different um, chunks as well in just a moment. Um, you'll see that this takes quite a long time to load on a fast 3G connection. It's important to note that even if it takes a very short amount of time to go across the network for a very large chunk of JavaScript, for instance, um, this, this large one that's actually 2.7 megabytes uncompressed, um, even if it takes a very short amount of time because you have a fast network, it still costs a, um, time for the browser to parse and process that JavaScript once it's available on the local machine. So even after the download is complete, it still is worthwhile um, to reduce the size of your JavaScript bundle um, for that reason. So let's talk about how to do that, how to reduce the size of your JavaScript bundle. Um, in, oh, go ahead and keep this open. Um, one, one of the ways to reduce the size of your JavaScript bundle is to make sure that you're using tree shaking throughout your application. Um, if you're not familiar with what tree shaking is, you can Google it. it there's quite a, quite a fair, fair amount of description of what it is on the internet. Um, but I'll give you a quick kind of um, overview of what it means. Basically, it means that when we import from a dependency, we only want to take the parts of the code that we're actually using and not the parts that we're not using. Um, so for instance, Lodash is a, a classic example of this, um, which Lodash is a, is a large utility library um, that can be used for a lot of different things. Um, and if we're only using one feature of Lodash, let's say the index of function, um, we shouldn't download or include all of Lodash, which has a hundred different utilities in it um, in our uh, code base. Um, to do that, we, uh, to, when we import the default export from Lodash, it can uh, include the entire library rather because at compile time, your application doesn't know what parts you're going to use. Um, in some cases, the, the compiler can be a bit more intelligent about this. Uh, and it depends a bit on the uh, on each different library. Um, so I think actually Lodash maybe has improved this um, since, since this was um, a real big problem. Um, but basically what, what the, um, the goal is, is to avoid importing the entire library when you only want to use a small part of it. So it's better to use this syntax, which is import star as underscore, which will use named imports rather than the default uh, import from Lodash. Um, or you can actually use that named in import explicitly with brackets. 
Um, so in both the better and the best case here, um, the compiler should be able to get rid of all the 99 other functions that Lodash exposes and only include index of in your library. Um, it's also important for, for tree shaking. Another important thing to think about is making sure that you don't have multiple copies of libraries in your bundle. Um, you can use yarn to look at that. You can use yarn list or yarn y, the name of the, um, uh, the function. So I'm actually going to, I'll do that really quickly here. Um, let's see, so I'm in this data store that we were talking about earlier. Um, if I say yarn uh, list, it will list all of the dependencies that I have. That's a little bit hard to read, but I can do yarn y, let's say at dhs2 slash ui. So this shows, um, so I'm going to do yarn list. So there's quite a few dependencies in this project. Um, and this will, uh, yeah, so this, this isn't um, the easiest to parse because there's a lot of things going on here. But if we want, if we know that there's one potentially problematic library, we can do yarn y at dhs2 slash ui, for instance. And this will show us that we have only one version of at GHS2 slash UI, uh, 6.6.2. If there were multiple versions, it would list both of them. And you would be able to think about ways to um, work on your dependency tree to be able to only have one version. I'm not going to get into too much how to do that today. But if that's something that you're running into, please feel free to reach out on Slack. Um, Another example is React. So React can be um, actually React DOM is much bigger than React. Um, so if you have multiple versions of that, that's problematic for a number of different reasons. Um, if you have a large um, visualization library, so actually we have Lodash probably as well. I bet we have several Lodash here as well. Um, we can actually see that this is um, multiple multiple copies of Lodash um, that are hoisted from a bunch of different places. Um, and so it only uses one copy in the end. Um, we have this found single version. But if the different dependencies had different uh, version requirements for Lodash, you might end up with multiple copies of Lodash, which could be problematic. Um, yeah, that's basically it. <clears throat> basically it. Uh, another thing you can do. Um, you can do yarn build, and this will return um, uh, some information about the, oops, I actually have a problem here. Let's see what our problem is in this example. Mm. Oh, we don't have React. That's weird. Anyway, we'll get to this in a minute. Um, but one another thing you can do is use uh, a tool called uh, Source Map Explorer. Mm, yeah, I think this should work. And this will give you an, uh, a, a visualization like this, which will tell you exactly what is included in the built bundle of your application and what it <clears throat> um, what those components are and how big they are. So it'll tell you which dependencies are included in your bundle, um, how they're uh, yeah, how they're tree, tree shaking out the parts that you're not using. Uh, and maybe if you have multiple copies of the same thing, you can visualize it there. <clears throat> um, finally, another um, thing that you can do to uh, reduce the size. This won't actually reduce the size of your bundle, but it will <coughs> split your bundle up into multiple pieces. Um, this is beneficial if, for instance, you have multiple pages in your application, and one of them requires a, um, a visualization library that's very heavy or very um, large, but you don't need that on the other routes, the other pages in your application. You probably should you shouldn't include that library in the, the download that happens when you first load the app. You should only load it when you move to the page that has that visualization component. Um, 
Um, in order to do this, you can use something called dynamic imports, which does bundle splitting in your um, application. <clears throat> this is how you do it in React with Webpack, and this works out of the box with the platform, but there are other ways to do this with other um, frameworks as well. Um, basically, what this will do is it will start to load the My Component. My Component is what's called react.lazy, um, which will import a, uh, another bundle with some of the, uh, like a, a subset of your total code. And then while it's waiting for that component to load, it will show this fallback um, component. This can be, usually it would be better to have this be a, a loading spinner or something like that. But just, I'm just saying loading dot, dot, dot here for simplicity. Um, and then once it's finished, it will render this my component um, uh, component that's loaded from a separate bundle. Um, we saw that in a couple slides back. We saw that here in the data visitor application that there are actually four different chunks that are all coming from the application. This one, uh, this 812 kilobytes is the one that has the, the expensive um, heavy uh, charting library in it. Um, but that doesn't need to load before the, the page can render. So the page renders once the first um, chunk loads, 168 kilobytes, um, I believe it's actually 174 kilobytes, and then it loads these other ones for um, doing some actual visualization on the page. So this is how you would do that in React. Um, and it's done automatically between the app shell and the app in the platform, um, which means that the app shell will load faster and first. Uh, before your app um, gets loaded after the fact. Um, but this uh, can also be done within your application to split up different um, different routes or different um, maybe heavy uh, pieces of processing that you need to do um, in only certain situations. OK, that's all that I had today for um, it was maybe a little bit longer presentation than I was expecting. But uh, that's all that I had today for um, performance. Um, I will now open it up if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, we will take a quick break. Any questions?